Wales National Football Show. Appreciate you coming aboard. Thank you very much. Please hit the like button. Burrow, Herbert, Hurts, Lamar Jackson. Who gets their deal done first? Who should set the bar? Who should set the bar first? See, if Burrow sets the bar first, how how much impact does this have on Jalen? Jalen's not going to get more than Burrow. So Burrow, Burrow, to me, of all these guys, Burrow's the dude that is going to set the bar. He's going to get $55 million. Hurts is not getting that. He's not getting more than, than, than Joe Burrow. He's not a better player. This guy changed the culture in shitbag Cincinnati. Cincinnati. We're not talking about formidable organizations like the Eagles or the Steelers or the Niners, or the Patriots. We're talking about the shit-stained Bengals who have zippers on their wallet. He rolls into Cincinnati. They've been into two AFC championship games in a row in a Super Bowl and were a quarter away from winning it. Cincinnati. He changed the entire landscape of that place you're now talk- you know what's crazy i never thought in a million years that i would be saying this holy cow the jags and the Bengals are better than the dolphins and the steelers what an upside down pseudo world i must live in right now it's incredible. It's incredible. I mean, wait a minute. The Jags and the Bengals are better than the Steelers and the Dolphins. When I grew up, Steelers and Dolphins and Raiders and Cowboys, they were the gold standard. Now, Jags and Bengals. That's insanity. That's insane. Shows you what one player can do or a coach can do for an organization. Look at what Tom Brady's done for the Patriot organization. <laughs> Guy buys the team from Victor Kime for I don't remember how much. I know he bought the land up around the place. That's how he got the team. Now look at it. All them titles. Brady's a direct result of that. I mean, what, you think because the Los Angeles Lakers are in L.A. that they're one of the best? No, they're there because when people look at them, Chamberlain, Shaq, Magic, Kobe, all them guys played. They were, they were like transcendent athletes that played at those places. Same in, same in Boston with the Celtics. I mean... To me, Burrow's going to get the most. Herbert is going to get less money than Jalen Hurts. You know why? He's not in a credible organization. They're in a nickel-dime organization. The Chargers are so poorly run by the Spanos family. They run that thing like a cash register, not like a pro football team. That's why they don't win. They'll never win. The Los Angeles Chargers will never win because of poor ownership. If the Eagle owner owned the Chargers, they would have had three Super Bowls by now. He's a terrible owner. He's a poor businessman. You know, when Gene Klein owned the team back in the day, he was a better, he, he was a better owner for the Chargers than what the Spanos family ever was. The, just terrible owners. Now they're bickering over money. I mean, get this. Watch this. I'll, I'll say this to you. Daniel Snyder may suck as an owner, and he does. But the Spanos family don't know what they're doing. I mean, they, they had Joey Boza hold out over 300 grand of a contract his rookie season for four games. 
Joey Boza comes up to me and goes, 300 grand. I go, I, I really, man. You know what? I, you know what I told Joey Boza when I was covering the Chargers? I was like this, shit, cut the punter. Get your ass out there, man. He goes, right. I know the father very well. Father played at Boston College, played back in my time. I was, I said this to Joey, man. I was like, cut the fucking punter, man. 300 grand? Dude, they're terrible owners. Okay? Just terrible. Tanner Sills, do you have a favorite NBA team? Dude, and I swear to you, by the way, you ask, people ask me this all the time. Sills, you're a fan of the Eagles? No, I love the fans. Okay? I'm, I'm really not a fan of any team. I'm a fan of players. When I was a kid growing up, it was the Giants because I have a family member who's in the Hall of Fame. So it's the Giants, but not now. NBA team, you're going to be stunned. It's the Sixers. But I hate who's own, who owns the team now and how they completely – a doc's a friend of mine too. You guys know it. He's been on the program here. And, and, and get this. This goes back to 4 4 4 4 and plus, one of my favorite athletes of all time played on that thing. Will Chamberlain. I, 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 I always rooted for them. The, uh, always since the 80s. Billy Cunningham, all them dudes. Honest to God, man, it was. Now, I think it's a shit show sometimes. Elton Brand. <laughs> hey, let's lose the sock to get Ben Simmons. That worked. I don't know. Love Moses Malone, man. Dude, Moses in my – hey, who is the greatest center in – before I move on, <clears throat> who's the greatest uh, center in Sixer history, Embiid, Wilt, or Moses? Who would you take? If you had to win a game seven of an NBA championship, who would you pick, Mo Malone? Dude, I think Moses won how many MVPs in Philly? Two? I know he won a couple in Houston – he was supposed to go to University of Maryland. That's how I know him. Instead, he went to the ABA. Wilt's the best. Dude, Moses delivered the title. Well, Chamberlain got one in 67. Chamberlain got one in 67. Moses Malone, because I know I could depend on him in that environment. <laughs> and dude, if I'm not mistaken, did they sweep the Lakers? Did that team did that team sweep the Lakers in the finals? That 83 team? Whew. That team was so good, man. Hey, and by the way, as a kid growing up, as a kid growing up, I wasn't an NBA fan. I didn't root for the Knicks. I rooted for the Nets with Dr. J. He was my I I wore Converse because of him. Dr. J, that big afro coming down the middle of the lane with that red, white, and blue on, that number 32. I was always stunned why he never wore 32 in LA and um, Philly. That number 32, man, him coming down. I, I had a poster in my bedroom of Dr. J up in the air. You know that one famous one he has? And it's he's slamming it. And, man, he was just so great to watch. He was, he was in my opinion, I think he was – he's probably more fun to watch than what LeBron is. I never got the excitement out of watching LeBron James as I did watching uh, Dr. J. Okay. Yep, they did. They swept, <laughs> they swept the Lakers, man. That Laker team had all them great superstars on it too, man. Had Kareem on that bitch. That's crazy too. Kareem, Kareem in my opinion, is the greatest basketball player of all time. He's the greatest basketball player of all time. You can't dispute it. Drafting Ben was one thing. I stopped with the Sixers when they led Jimmy. Oh, man, Jimmy Butler down with down with um, uh, Pat Riley. Come on, man. I love Pat Riley. I covered Pat. Pat, I love Pat Riley. Oh, my God. He's so crazy. You know, you know how we got LeBron? So he's got like, I think he's got one as a player, broadcaster, and plus the five rings. So I think he's got seven. 
No, he got another one early. Um, the way the, the early one, then the Shaq, the Shaq one, then the LeBron one. So I think he's got like eight rings. So before before LeBron got there, he had a little satchel with all his rings. He poured them on the table and he goes, You want one of these? Try one on. <laughs> LeBron's like, what do you mean? He goes, try one on. See how it feels to be a champion. You come here, I'll, you'll get one of those. Dude, is that not dope? Okay. Right? They choose Ben Simmons over Jimmy Butler. The moment Butler made Simmons and Red Brown uncomfortable, it was over. That's right. He settled for the wrong dude. Butler's a handful. Butler's a player. I'll tell you what, man. That guy, in my opinion, there's one dude in the NBA that has the same kind of energy that Kobe Bryant has. It's Jimmy Butler. Jimmy Butler has Kobe Bryant intensity. That's why I like Jimmy Butler. Hey, one last Pat Riley story before I go on here. What are we looking at here? Um, 2024, and also seven players on the Eagles I want to see step up. One quick Pat Riley story. I said, Pat, game seven, Boston. What did you write on that? What did, what, what did you write on that, on that board that you had there? He goes, because I go, I, I thought I saw something. He goes, what'd you think? Is it said writing. So Pat writes this down. I go, what was the play you wrote? He went like this. All the players looked at him. I said, you wrote will. He goes, you have to have the will right now. It's in your grasp. Take it. They beat him. I'm like, dude. Will. Man, Pat Riley, in my opinion, very underrated coach. I'll tell you this. Phil Jackson's a great coach because he knows how to spin the dishes. Okay? Pat Riley's a great in-game motivator. Come on, Captain. We need more from you. Come on, Captain. Pat's got nine rings. Okay, fair enough. All right. I I wrote down a list of seven players. Seven players that I think have to elevate their game for the Eagles to get back to the NFC Championship. You guys want to add some to the mix? Please do. But I got seven guys. Seven that I wrote. Number seven, I got Boston Scott. You know, I don't know what it is today, Tone. I, I'm being fair. I thought about this topic last night. I'm laying there going, you know, I've been pretty, pretty shitty to Boston Scott. How could you be shitty to a guy that hasn't had opportunity? Give him 200 carries. Let's see what he can do. Behind that old line, Sills, give him opportunity. Before you can dog a guy, he's got to get opportunity. That's what I said when we were talking about the, the Eagle defense today. He's in a different role now, Jordan Davis. He's a starter. This is different. Being a rotation guy versus being a starter, completely different things. Okay. Boston Scott, let me just hear you guys. Boston, Boston Scott gets 230 carries this year. Two, hey, wait a minute. How many carries last year did um, Miles Sanders get? How many, does anyone know off the top of their head? I, I, I know Jalen had like 167 carries a year ago. How many carries? Did Miles Sanders have last year? And see what Tone says. 259. Pretty good number. Boston Scott gets 259 carries behind that old line. 
Now, remember something. It's 17 games. So let's do the math. Okay, let's do the math here. I can't believe I'm being this fair. Sounds like I'm, um, I don't know. Okay, 1,000 divided by 17 is 58 yards a game. To be exact, 58.8. To be exact, 58.8. How many how many yards do you think Boston Scott should we count on for him? 58 game 58.8 yards per game gets you 1000 yards. Believe it or not Boston Scott has never had more than 87 carries in a season and he's averaged 4.3 yards for his career. He's totally an unknown then. Arthur just loves Penny. Hey, Pen, hey, hey, Arthur. Once again, Penny's ability, you got to start more than two games a year, dude. Six yards a carry, eight quarters is not somebody you count on. He has started two games a year. Two games a year in five years. Would, would it be fair? You think Boston Scott could run for 58 yards a game behind that old line? Scott has a nose for the end zone. 10 TDs in the last two seasons. Think about this, for instance. Well, so he has 10 touchdowns in the last two years, and Miles Sanders has 11. Didn't he, like, have one or none the year previous? Wasn't it something like that? Like I, I know this. He didn't have a lot of touchdowns the year before. He had zero the year before. So in the same two years with less carries, Boston Scott had many touchdowns as Miles Sanders? Okay. I'm going to give this kid a chance. You guys sold me. And also, that's why Howie gave him $2 million. I'm sold. I think the kid's going to be effective. You're right. For me to sit here and go, Sills, the guy's never had more than 87 carries. He had as many touchdowns in the last two years as Miles Sanders has. And he's $5 million cheaper. Okay. Maybe you're right, John, and I'm wrong. Maybe they won't skip a beat at running back. Hey, what about the size? Are they pretty close in, sat in stature? Are, are, are they pretty pretty close in how they're built, or is Scott smaller? Looks to me Scott's a little smaller than Miles, and maybe not as thick. Um, I, I, I might be wrong because sometimes guys just look bigger in their gear than other guys do. I don't know. I don't know what you know, because Sanders looks like a pretty big dude in his gear. Scott's five six two zero three. That's a small dude, but thick. Five six two zero three. That's kind of like sprawls a little bit. Sanders is 5'11". Wow, that's a big size difference. 2'11". That's a big size difference. Mm. However, Emmett's 5'9". I'm not saying Boston Scott's Emmett Smith. Okay, I am not saying that. Okay. I don't know. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna give Boston Scott a shot here. I'm gonna give him a I'm gonna, I, I, I and you know what too? I'll tell you something else, Tone, that I think I see sometimes with him. I think he runs better in traffic at times than what I saw with Sanders. Sometimes Sanders runs right into guys. Like, you know, he misses the first guy, then the second size, boom. 
Okay. He, 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 he avoids the first guy where Scott, in my opinion, if you watch him on film, he's pretty elusive in there in traffic. Okay. So I don't know. Maybe he's a more look, look at me. So I said, Boston Scott, I'm pretty, you know, get this. You guys have changed my opinion of him. You have. Rashad Penny. Here's what I'm hoping for Rashad Penny. This goes right into Arthur's role. I am not hoping for anything other than this. Rashad, give us 15 games. If Rashad gives the Eagles 15 games, he could put up six, 700 yards. He could. He's, he's more talented than Scott. He just can't play. He just doesn't play. He's always hurt, and he's never played a full season, and he's never lived up to his reputation of a first-round pick ever in any aspect. Some would go, well, he's had two, three games, folks. You still can't count on that player to build your offense around him. That's why Kenneth Walker was signed and drafted as high as he was. They moved off him for that. So this is all I'm hoping for with Rashad Penny. Give me 15 games, kid. If I'll tell you where you could really use Penny in the postseason. Get him to the postseason. You know what I'm saying, Tone? Run, run, run Gainwell, run Scott. Just get Rashad to the postseason. He could be formidable in the postseason. Some go like this, Sills. What about a red zone? Red zone? I don't want him getting injured right now. The guy's made of paper mache. Running back, Mo from Minnesota. It's good. I've, I've watched him the last couple of years. Remember something, GI. I vote on all the All American teams and all the awards. Every award from Heisman down. I, I vote on the top 25, everything. And I watch all these guys. He's a pretty good player, man. Um, the coach up there, I really like the coach. He's turned the Gophers around and done a really great job up there. Um, I thought after the George Floyd incident, I thought it'd be tougher to recruit because of how Minneapolis is now when it comes to the policing around there. It's been pretty tough for recruiting, as he's told me, but it's gotten better again. They're getting more players in there, okay? Uh, they're sending players back to the Gophers. I love that. I, I got recruited there. I like that program. It's a legendary program. Like pre-1960, all the way up till 1960, shit, man, Minnesota was considered one of the preeminent programs in the Big Ten next to Ohio State and Michigan. I really like what they do up there. I, I, I forget the head coach's name. He just signed a brand-new contract up there, too. They're really – it's really a good program. And he, he, he's a good back. Um, I would say I, – I, I would probably say – Fifth, sixth round, something like that. Okay. Seals Otis Anderson went eighth overall. Was he worth the pick? Well, his rookie year, he was the offensive player of the year, led the NFL in rushing with 1,600 yards, Maurice. You tell me. Otis Anderson led the NFL in rushing his first season in the NFL with the Cardinals. You tell me if you think it was worth it. Won the Rookie of the Year award. Was it? I, he may have even won the MVP. He, may, I, I, I don't know. I, he may have won the MVP first or second year. OJ Anderson had him on the program. Friend of mine, Hurricane, and I, OJ led the NFL in rushing his first year. Number five. I got Cam Jurgens here. Okay. I got Cam Jurgens. Am I concerned? No. It's a new position. They're sliding him over. I would say, um, by the way, how big is he? How tall is he and how much does he weigh? Okay. How, how, how big is he? 
because the Eagles love gargant. Hey, they don't just love big dudes. They love gargantuan dudes to play in the O line. I mean, there's some of the biggest human beings I've ever seen in my life are in that old line in Philadelphia. I mean, they love, dude, Kelsey is a small dude compared to the rest of them guys. His skill set keeps him on that field. And obviously, he's a Hall of Fame player. He's 6'3", 290. That's kind of small. Now he's a center. I'm going to tell you something, John. 6'3", 290, playing guard in the NFL. You might get thrown around. But his advantage is he's playing in between Lane and he's playing next to Jason. Those two guys are going to help him a lot. He has got to be so technically sound. Dude, I'm telling you, a 6'3", 290 guy playing against that kid up in New York or the guy in Washington, he'll throw his ass around like a beanbag. That's a tiny dude. Today's NFL, that's tiny. Okay. You can't add height. I think that guy's got to come into the season. If he's going to play guard, at least 315, 320. Or he's going to get thrown around. 290? Shit, dude, there's no guy. The two the two defensive tackles that play in Philly are 325 and north of it. And the better athletes are on the defensive side of the ball. Fletcher Cox is 320 and the other guy's 345. And you got a guard 290? I don't know. Dexter Lawrence is 335. <laughs> Dude. I'm just saying, man. This guy better have some bricks in his pocket. Now, again, the advantage is that you have these two really great football players on each side of him. That's going to keep the whole thing in my opinion, okay. He's got to play well, though. Is he going to play as good as Isaac Sayamalo? Absolutely not. It's not his natural position. He's a center. Now, will he have better feet maybe than Isaac? Maybe. Will he be able to run better in traffic? Possibly. He really does have an added advantage of having those two guys on each side of him, though. And... He's got Jeff Stoutland helping him. Maurice goes, Mike Webster was 6'1", 255. Yeah, 1974. Yeah, Maurice, 1974. Ray Lewis was 6'3", 255. I mean, it's a different league now, dude. I didn't have 290 defensive linemen back then. They were 250 pounds, too. Dude, that's back when you put your helmet in your back pocket. I'm kidding. No disrespect. <laughs> yeah. 255 pound old lineman. Come on, man. You got linebackers in today's NFL 255. Hassan Reddick's 250. Hassan Reddick is the same size as Mike Webster. Okay. Think about that. You look at Hassan Reddick and go, he's small. Mike Webster was that size. Okay, I mean, that's that's how much the game has grown. Number four, these are the seven players that I think have to have and show up for this team to get back to the NFC title game. I got Reed Blankenship. How many think people how many people think Reed will play well this year? How many people think he's going to play well? Reed Blankenship. You, yeah, you do, huh? Tone, what do you make? Reed Blankenship. I know Barrett's down on him. Um, I don't know. I'm, I don't know if I'm down on him again. Is this another lack of opportunity? because he had so many good players back there last year. You got to take that into consideration. Same thing that we're taking with the kid from 
Chicago coming into the Eagle off uh, defense. I had trash around him. Okay, defense was on the field the whole time. Yale says he played well. John goes, I like him. Okay. I'm not down on him, but I respect him stepping into that, into his role in short order. I'd like to know what Avante Maddox's role is going to be. What's his role? Are they going to play him at safety? Or are they going to rotate him corner to safety? How, what are they going to do with Avante Maddox? I think he's got to be on the field somehow. How do you put Avante Maddox out there? Is he too slow? Possibly. It's probably why he's not getting a lot of playing time. Okay. 5.30 Eastern. Yeah, Rick Gosselin. We're going to talk Eric Allen. Um, has to stay on the field. He does. Why well, be down on him? CJ Gardner Johnson wasn't even playing. So who's not there but Epps? Your safety position, in my opinion. So you don't have him in the you don't have Gardner in the slot. You have your your safeties right now. You're pretty comfortable with your safeties being Terrell Edmonds and Reed Blankenship. Okay. Quite, quite frankly, we'll see how they affect the corner play because that unit last year with Epps, with Gardner Johnson, with Darius Slay, and James Bradbury, the way those guys all played as one unit, we'll see what they can. You see, the tentacles, Slay and those guys benefited because they played pretty well at the safety. They played better at the safety position a year ago than what a lot of people thought they were going to play going into the season. When they finished it, it was a solid unit. Okay? It was a solid unit. Well, Edmonds, and as, as I said, and I, and I heard Barrett. Barrett's right. You're going to get a more skill. Wait a minute. You're going to get a more technically sound player in Edmonds than C.J., CJ's the better athlete and is going to make better impact plays. That's who he is. Why? He's learning the position. Think about that. Never played the position, led the NFL in interceptions. That's why he's making $8 million. And the reason that Terrell Edmonds was released was because the Eagle, uh, the, the Steelers wanted to upgrade. You know who he is. Not a rip. It's what it is. Steelers don't move off of people. Now, money plays a factor. Of course it does. Okay, money plays a factor. Money play, money's playing a factor with the Eagles and who they're signing now. You know, I put down for number three linebackers. Dean, Morrow. I put these guys down. I put them as a unit. That unit has to play well. Not great, because watch. Do you think both these guys are going to have over 100 tackles this coming season? You think you're going to get 270 tackles out of these two guys, Morrow and Dean? What did, what did, what did um, Kaiser White have, 106? Um, TJ was up there like 140? So you think you're going to get 270 tackles out of those two guys? Two hundred seventy tackles. That's a lot of production. Those guys were good. I wouldn't call the Eagle linebackers great last year. They still were productive. I might, I mean, unless I'm wrong on the uh, Kaiser White. I thought he had like 106 and TJ was around 140. That sounds right. I, I could have swore I saw 140. May have been more. 
It's 270 tackles between two dudes that are no longer on the team that you guys are sitting here telling me, well, we're going to get a guy off the street and a dude who couldn't see the starting lineup going to step in and cover those guys. That's a lot of tackles, man. Okay? I need high-impact tackles. I could care less if the guy has over 100 tackles. That just means you were chasing a lot, especially when you play on the worst defensive unit in the NFL. Eagles were on a second-best unit. And one of, consider one of the worst tacklers. I liked him, too, Yo, know, I like Kaiser. Kaiser's the kind of guy you have to have on your ball team because you know why? He's affordable. See, that's what people don't – do you guys know – I don't know if you know this. Do you know half the league is undrafted? Why is that? Because of a cap. What do you think? You can have a whole team of first rounders like the NBA? You can't have that. I mean, there's half the league is undrafted guys and lower round dudes. Kaiser White is a perfect NFL player. He's never going to break the bank, and he's going to be a safe guy to have in your defense. He's a perfect dude to have. See, what happens with a guy like T.J. Edwards, he goes to – watch this. T.J. Edwards goes to Chicago, and he stinks to join up. They'll cut his ass after one year because they're not paying a guy $7 million to flop because there's already a question mark on how good you know, he's going to be up there. We'll see. Chicago, I mean, NFL guys, because then you start pricing yourself out of the league. Kaiser White's a perfect five and a half million bucks. He goes to Jonathan Gannon in Arizona. That's a great sign for Gannon. He's solid. He's dependable. Build, you know, he's not going to build a defense around him, but he's going to know in the huddle what to do and what he's asking him to do. That's really a good sign by Arizona. Okay, that's really a good sign. Number one is Jordan Davis. What will Jordan Davis do? New role? New optimism? Okay. Now you're a starter. Your preparation's different. Expectations are different. What happens is now, it's time to pay the rent. You have to pay the rent on your 13th pick here. Last year, you were in your redshirt year, so to speak. Now, rents due. Are you the 13th pick? Are you the steal of the draft? See, again, folks, this is, and and, and I I hear people doing this all the time. You've got to pick his pass rushing up. He's never going to be a guy who's going to give you 10 sacks. He never has been. You don't become that player in the NFL when you've never been a productive guy. So his impact, again, Barrett said it right today. His impact is in assist. Here, here's going to be Jordan Davis's biggest impact on your football team this year. If you finished 10th and if you finish 10th in run defense and the opposing teams are held under 118 yards rushing every game, he impacted the run game, which in turn turns your edge rushers loose. See, that's what Barrett was talking about assisting. You see, his impact, he could have maybe 20 tackles this year, right? But if he controls that line in the middle with Fletcher, that allows the outside perimeter guys to eat. And that makes those guys, like, he could have 25 tackles this year. One sack. Someone go, Jesus, man, 13th pick? Well, If you watch it on film, though, was he instrumental in having one of the better run defenses in the NFL? Yeah, they finished fifth. What? Eagles were fifth in run defense? They'll win the Super Bowl. 
If the Eagles finish fifth, not the sacks, if the Eagles finish fifth and run defense, they'll win the Super Bowl. That's three and outs on the other side. That's turnover opportunities for your secondary. That's not leaning on your linebackers to have to. If that unit improves from 16th to being in the top 10, win the Super Bowl. Why? Because the differential between the 49ers and the Eagles is the quarterback. The only thing that separates these two, 49ers have a little better roster, a little better. And the quarterback closes that gap. It's a pick them game. Flip a coin there with that two teams. The problem is, though, at the most important position in San Francisco, you – here, watch this. You, you don't have to count on whether or not that guy's going to suck. Jalen Hurts is not going to – Jalen Hurts may not play a super game. He's not going to cost you one. And, again, the play in the Super Bowl, that shit happens. You've never in your life since that game ended heard me kill him for that play. I never will because that's not who he is. Josh Allen will put the ball on the ground like that, and I kill that guy for dropping that ball against Minnesota because that cost him home field advantage. That's a turnover that hurt your team. That's a turnover that hurts your team's chances to go to the Super Bowl. In my opinion, him dropping the ball with less than a minute left in, in Buffalo probably cost them a chance to go to the Super Bowl. Am I wrong? They would have had home field advantage. They wouldn't have had to worry about the Cincinnati game. They'd have beat Minnesota. They'd have won 15 ball games. They'd have had a home field. You had home field with Kansas City having to go to Buffalo. I'll take the mods. Allen's beating them. Can't have that. Back to the back to the end zone. Minute left in the game. Dude, all you have to do is take a knee. You win. Home field advantage. The play, Jalen, happens to everybody. Happens to everybody. Hollywood says Hassan was a milk carton in the Super Bowl. He wasn't the only defender in that Super Bowl that was on a milk carton too, my friend. He, wa- he, wasn't, he wasn't the only guy that was on that milk carton. The point is, is that Jordan Davis, and, I, you know, look, I think he and I were on the same page. He's a first-round pick. He ain't the 13th pick. None of us thought that. I had him down in the 20s, 22 to 25. He's that. He's that. Again, I mean, the Aveda kind of guy. Okay. That guy Baltimore used to have back in the day. What was his name? Noga? I forget his name. Okay. Like somebody like that. So, but but again, to sit here and say he's going to be a 10, 10, 10, 11 sack guy, he doesn't have the skill to be a pass rusher. He, uh, he, he's not very skilled as a pass rusher. He's got to get better. He's got to learn. Now, can he learn that? Yeah, you can learn that. Tracy Rocker is a really good coach. Yeah, Nagata, that's, that, that guy, he was really good in Baltimore. You know, Baltimore, hey, Tanner, I think that's one of the pieces Baltimore has been missing. And why they don't longer play the same defense is because they don't have that stout nose like they do. You want to play in a 34, you better have that guy. And they don't have that guy right now. That's why when you watch Baltimore play, that's not the same defensive football team that we've seen in years is because they're not stout inside. They used to be one of the better stout defenses going all the way back, either Sam Adams or or, or, or Goose and them guys. They were always stout. Great on the perimeter, Suggs rushing the passer, Lewis in the middle, Reed in the back, 
And their corners were Rod Woodson and Deion Sanders. I mean, <laughs> dude, that's a Hall of Fame defense you got there. Cumry was good. Unfortunate injury in the Super Bowl he had. But he, he was a good ball player. He was good. I think he got hurt in that 49ers Super Bowl. I think it was the Niners Super Bowl that he got hurt in down in Miami. I was at that game, actually. Um, Yeah, they no longer have 11. They no longer have that guy. And when you run that 34, boy, you better have linebackers that got some bricks in their pocket and a nose that can play that triangle. Because if you ain't got that guy in the middle there, you're going to get blown off the ball. 34 is a – man, your linebackers better beat the shit out of people if you're in a 34. And the Eagles don't have – they're a little – hey, would we agree? They're a smaller defense than they were a year ago. They're smaller at the linebacker position. They're going to be smaller in the, sa in, in the safety position. They're a smaller defense. Okay? So smaller defense. Take it on big dudes. Hmm. Saragusa was an undrafted free agent at a pit. I know Tony. I knew Tony. God rest his soul. I think he's a Jersey dude. Um, my, one of my boys, Tony Brown, who played with me in high school, played at Pitt, started four years up there at Pitt with Freilich on the other side. And I got a chance. I was going to go to Pitt. I didn't want to play for Foge, though. Foge Fazio, man, the Silver Fox, come rolling in. Hey, Sills, how you doing? Hey, Sills, how you doing? Yeah. I don't know. But they, they, hey, Pitt. Pitt, in my opinion, has put out some of the greatest football players in the history of the National Football League. I mean, Pitt. Pitt is legendary players. It's one of the greatest pro. Hey, when someone goes, Sills, there's a great player at Pitt. That's not a shock. D Lyman's at Pitt. Okay, really? Look how many great players have come out of Pittsburgh. Darrell Rivas, Curtis Martin. Tony Dorsett, Bill Fralick, Jumbo. Did Jumbo Elliott come out of there? I think he's a Michigan guy. Jim Sweeney, Russ Grimm, Hugh Green, Ricky Jackson. <laughs> it's uh, the receiver in Arizona. I mean, dude, they've had a lot of great football players at that place. Dan Marino. All them great football players. I'm going to, hey guys, I'm going to give you a list. And you're going to be the very first people to listen to some of the names that are going to be thought of for next year's NFL draft. Rick Gosselin's going to join us also in hour three. I'm making a move to try to get Eric Allen in the Hall of Fame. Or at least, how about this? I can't promise that because I don't have a vote for that. But what I do is, I put intel together for many of these Hall of Fame voters. Okay, a lot of guys, they've come on the program and say, Sills, you know, I send you my final and I want to get your opinion. There's about 20 other guys that are on each and every single one of these guys' ballots. And what they do is they ask me, pick my five. I told you guys before, my pro I, I, I understand Joe Thomas was a good player, but I wanted to know what the... You know, what 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 was the one differential when you've never had a winning season? You played an 0 16 team that you thought he was one of the better players in the history of the league. I, I had a hard time with that one. Leroy Butler, I completely disagreed with. Someone asked me after the vote, I went, not I wouldn't have even had a conversation about him. Rick Gosselin said he'd like to do about a hundred. My friend Mark Gasano belongs on a list making the case for him. He knows it. So we're going to do that, and we're going to talk to him about the Cowboys. He covers the Dallas Cowboys for Talk of Fame Network. He was a columnist for the Dallas Morning News for years, wrote numerous books, covers the Cowboys. 
I actually think Jerry Jones has had a good offseason here. I can't believe what I'm going to say. I think the Cowboys are better now, today, than they were at the end of the year last year. They got better. But then, one of the most important things happened. What was that? Mike McCarthy said he was going to start calling plays, and I went like this. <laughs> oh, Watch this. You built up all that good work. You built up all that good work. Look at this. The needle's going over here. Mike McCarthy's calling the plays. <laughs> I went, damn. Man, you did all that work. You got it going. You're going in the right direction. You're going there. All of a sudden, watch this. Damn. Mike McCarthy's calling the plays. <laughs> I was like, man, thank God. Eagle fans must be going. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. I, I really, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> oh, man. Ladies don't like that. Hugh, get yourself out of the gutter, man. Hey, Hugh, this is a family show, man. <laughs> okay. Sills on wedding night. Come on, Arthur. See, Arthur gives me a ton of shit every day. He does, man. But he's here every day. Thank you, Arthur. I appreciate it. You're a true sports talk person. Hour number three coming up. Keep it here on.